Hi, this is Long. Welcome to our video series on search patterns for the most common studies in radiology. Please note that this is an introduction to study interpretation. An enormous amount of detail is omitted for brevity. Continue dedicated reading, seeing as many cases as possible, and keep getting feedback from subspecialists during the course of your training. All right, guys, today we're going to talk about an approach to the MRI lumbar spine. Um, there's quite a bit to go through, uh, but a basic approach that I like to use is to like all studies, take a look at what's going on with the patient, the indication, history, any prior studies that are CT or MRI, or anything else that's gonna incidentally image the spine, including abdomen and pelvis studies. Um, then we take a look, uh, I, I like to use an approach that's basically an outside-in approach. I look at all the extraspinal anatomy first, the incidentally image, visceral, uh, structures, the soft tissues, everything that's outside the spine, okay? Uh, frequently on these studies, you'll be provided a kind of stir or water sensitive sequence, which I use first to look for evidence of acute injury for collections, for edema, for kind of like things that, that kind of warrant uh, immediate attention. That's like the first step. And then I'll ultimately use that and transition into primarily using the T2s um, to look at the spinal alignment, the preservation of the vertebral bodies, the, the, the posterior elements, the discs, and then ultimately look at how that uh, anatomy impacts the uh, neuroforamen of the spinal canal, and then ultimately how that impacts the intraspinal anatomy, including the thecal sac, the uh, spinal cord, and the nerve roots. Um, as they course and uh, through the spinal canal and ultimately out through the nerve foramina. If we are looking at a post-contrast exam as well, um, then I'll either intersperse that as needed with findings uh, during the pr um, search prior to the post-contrast images or look through the entire anatomy just on the post-contrast images themselves. Okay, so kind of an important thing with all MRI is to lay out your uh, studies in a sensible manner. Um, once I have a sense of what's going on with the patient, I've done kind of my background understanding, I typically like to hang, you know, all the sagittals together, all the axials together, and then as needed, take a look at like any sort of localizers or other sorts of kind of uh, sequences that are going to image things outside of the usual field of view of these other sequences. So here's our STIR T2, T1 post, uh, pre contrast, and then a post contrast. And then this is also a T2 here. Um, T1 pre-contrast and a post-contrast, and here's our localizers. So what I typically like to do is I, um, and I'll scroll these together and then make them larger as needed. I first look, you know, in the visceral abdomen pelvis and posteriorly, all right? And I'm gonna do that on each sequence, um, primarily focus on the stir in T2 and post-contrast, and then look through the localizer images and basically make sure that like the, the image lung bases, the uh, solid organs, you know, in the abdomen and pelvis, the uh, GI tract, the pe uh, peritoneum, lymph node stations, everything looks good, looks fine, and without any sort of incidental mass lesion or confluent inflammatory process or incidental pathology that might explain the patient's symptoms, okay? Um, I'll scroll up and down throughout the uh, axial images and make sure that I'm looking at that same anatomy, being particularly careful on the T2s and the post-contrast images. I'll be particularly careful to remember to look at the incidentally image osseous pelvis. You're going to see the sacroiliac joints. You're going to see, you know, portions of the sacrum um, and, you know, pelvic visceral structures on these. Um, you have to note that different areas of the anatomy are going to be imaged on these different sequences, you know. The uh, lateral aspects of the pelvis may be seen more on the axials or on the localizer images and not seen as you scroll to the far sides of the uh, sagittal image. So just be very be aware of that and be sure to look at those edges and corners. <clears throat> okay, so once we've taken a look at the incidentally imaged anatomy, we can kind of go into the evaluation of you know, spine and, uh, you know, things that may explain what's going on with the patient. So I usually like to start with a stir and look, uh, you know, again, we've already taken a look at the kind of uh, extra spinal anatomy, but then also looking at the spine, the, the vertebra, the discs, the facets, the posterior elements, the ligamentous complex, uh, complexes, you know, anterior, posterior, uh, spinal laminar, you know, um, Around around the uh, the joint capsule at the posterior elements between the spinous processes, you know, looking for edema. You know, uh, you can you can kind of see that within the bone, surrounding the bone, around the joints, um, 
and the kind of looking uh, also if there's edema of any focally with any sort of disc. All right, so this is going to give you a sense of fluid signal. So I, that can be an evidence that can help you sort out if anything, if there's any sort of acute inflammation or an acute injury. Okay, um, and then because uh, the T2s are uh, also you know will provide you some sense of that fluid signal, but have better resolution typically than the stir. Um, or, or less noisy, you know, these are going to be kind of more workhorse for to delineate the anatomy. These and the, you know, the T1s. Um, so typically, one of the things that's really important uh, to get a sense of, and you, you may do this even before you start delineating or kind of um, localizing any anatomy, is you have to get a sense as to where you're numbering the spine. Uh, with differing points of, well, with differing variants of anatomy, you can have tr transitional lumbar cervical anatomy. Sometimes you're going to have, it's going to be not necessarily clear where there's L5, where there's S1. And, and if you can't correlate with prior studies, it's prior CT abdomen pelvis exams, prior radiographs, and to really get a sense, um, you're going to have to leave some sort of caveat or just make sure that you're being consistent across prior exams. And if there's any confusion, you know, the gold standard is to number from the C1, C2 area. Um, but you know it can it can be a major pitfall to number the vertebra incorrectly when there are these variants that can, can confuse the picture. So make sure you do that prior to really kind of talking about the localization or the level of any any sort of abnormality. Okay. Um, and so once we've done that, we've taken a look at, you know, focal edema, any sort of issue with, uh, you know, that could be an acute abnormality. You want to take a look at, you know, the alignment, you know, similar to radiographs, the, you know, uh, that the vertebra are in alignment in the anterior posterior direction. You're going to see if there's any scoliosis, any lateral asthesis. Um, you can take those anterior posterior spinal laminar, supraspinous kind of lines. Um, You'll look for preservation of vertebral body heights. You'll look for preservation of the uh, the disc height and signal. Okay, and you're going to do that even for the uh, incidentally imaged sacral uh, at the inferior aspect of the study. Or sometimes you're going to see some thoracic vertebra as well. Um, and then ultimately, you're going to look for signal in the vertebral bodies uh, in, in the discs and. Typically, on I like to look for any sort of suspicious, and you, you remember, you want to do this not just in the body, but in the posterior elements and the whole of the osseous structures that you're seeing them. I mean, you can see some of the pelvis here as well. Um, you're going to look for uh, replacement, abnormal marrow replacement on the T1 pre-contrast, you know, typically darker than muscle or disc, though I use like to use muscle more so because the disc signal can change with pathology. Um, you can compare that to muscle, look for abnormal marrow replacement, compare that to marrow edema, you know, and then if there's any sort of abnormal, you can look for uh, abnormal contrast enhancement, okay? So you're looking at the bone marrow signal, you're going to look at disc signal similarly, okay? Um, and then once you have a sense, I've taken a look at alignment, the morphology of the vertebra, um, it's very components and you looked at the signal um, what we're going to do is take a look at how any sort of degenerative or disc abnormality impacts the uh, spinal canal and nerve foramina okay so one it is perhaps um, you know I actually still like the uh, the sagittals to go through and see where uh, what levels will have disc abnormalities and how that impacts the caliber of the spinal canal and the nerve foramina, which are laid out well because they go out very, you know, um, kind of straight laterally in the lumbar spine to get a sense of what what the uh, level of the disc is and what where any disc protrusion may be, the extent of facet arthropathy and other contributors inclusive of ligamentum flavum um, redundancy or hypertrophy and epidural fat or other sort of mass lesions, inflammatory changes um, or other abnormalities. You, you know, the axials will be good for each level. And, you know, I would incur, you know, encourage you to be very, you know, very careful in lining up your, you know, axials with your um kind of sagittal images to make sure that you can kind of problem solve any abnormalities as you, as you see them. And so you'll do that at each disc level all the way down um, and commenting not just on whether this, what the contributions to spinal canal and neuroforamal stenosis are, um, but also any impact on exiting nerves or descending nerves to see if there's any contact um, at each of those levels. And you do that all the way down and not forgetting um, where appropriate that there are you are going to see sometimes some sacral foramina uh, at the inferior aspect of the study um, so once we've taken a look at the impact of 
spinal pathology, frequently degenerative, sometimes you know, plastic, inflammatory, or other developmental even, um, on the spinal canal or nerve foramina, we're, we're ultimately going to take a look at the uh, intraspinal compartment. So what I, what I mean by that is the thecal sac, the cord, the caudoquine nerve roots, and they're exiting into the nerve foramina, into those nerve seats laterally. Um, so first thing is to, to get a sense as to where the caudoquina, ter- you know, where the caudoquina terminates, and you can kind of get that, get a good sense of that by correlating the axials and the uh, sagittals, seeing if that's in normal position. If they're, if it's normally, you know, uh, not just in the craniocaudal dimension, but if it's displaced anteriorly or posteriorly, if it's tethered, where there's a mass lesion or tethering more inferiorly. Um, you'll look for uh, abnormal thickening of the nerve roots. You'll also look for enhancement in the appropriate circumstance. Um, and then, especially as a result of any sort of compressive, compressive pathology, you're going to be very careful to look for displacement, deformity of the cord of the descending nerve roots uh, in their course in the thecal sac, um, as well as in, in their, into the lateral recesses and into the nerve foramina. Okay? Um, I should note that frequently it's the act, the sagittal images are going to have a lot, you know, a lot of artifacts uh, in the intraspinal compartments. Um, and, and, and frequently you can kind of best rely on the axial images to give you a true sense of cord signal abnormality. Okay. So, um, and, and in addition to mass effect or kind of involvement of, of structures that you're, you know, pathology you're seeing in the spine, you're going to be just very careful to look for um, collect, subtle collections, mass lesions, or even nodularity that you're seeing in the intraspinal compartment, because that may not be uh, immediately obvious unless you're looking specifically. Um, so we basically kind of covered from an outside in approach the anatomy. Um, and then I have sprinkled in points where you may reference post-contrast images, which is, which is here. Okay. Um, you can, you can tell that these are post-contrast frequently because the epidural, uh, venous plexus posteriorly will be enhanced. Um, and free, you know, frequently, uh, uh, as you scroll up and down, you'll, you'll see some, um, small, um, uh, vessels in the intraspinal compartment. It's, it's, if you haven't looked at the extraspinal anatomy on the post-contrast images, it's especially important to go through that uh, carefully because you can pick up incidental pathology and characterize things you've already seen. Um, the key, key thing with the post-contrast images is to characterize any abnormality found in the search up till that point and to go through the entirety of the anatomy if you haven't in other parts to look for abnormal enhancement. Um, similar to the to looking for abnormal cord signal abnormality on the T2 weighted sequence, it is it is best practice to look um, very specifically at the axial uh, post contrast images to sort out subtle abnormality. As sometimes these sagittals, as you can see uh, in this example, um, can be kind of noisy with uh, even with like a saturation band to cover up you know, pulsations from major abdominal, uh, vessels, um, and, you know, breathing, uh, you still are going to get you. It's, it's not uncommon to get some artifact there. So you just want to correlate and make sure that any, any, um, uh, you know, signal that you're seeing here, uh, is, is correlate with a true app, ab, you know, true abnormal enhancement you're seeing on the axials. Um, it's very, it, it can be very useful also to get a sense if there is, uh, if you're applying a fat saturation technique to the post-contrast images as to see whether that is homogeneous throughout the field of view of the study here, these are non-fat sided post-contrast images. Um, so it can be difficult to distinguish, for example, say a fat signal versus post-contrast images, um, in, in this circumstance. So, uh, in, in that case, taking a look at the fat saturation is somewhat less important in these circumstances. However, you may, uh, be advantaged by being able to actually do subtraction. Let's see if we can do that here. So let's do this and let's see if we can create, even do some post-processing and, you know, throw our, uh, let's see, no, our post contrast and then our pre contrast and see if we can get a, uh, subtraction image out of that. Let's see. No, it's not perfect. So this is going to be a limited ability to take a look at true enhancement, but that is one strategy that we can use in some circumstances. Let's see if that actually works in a different way. 
Yeah. So actually, the axials will do it better. So if we can, we can actually create subtraction images of the pre and post contrast as long as they are both either fat saturated or not, or um, that can give you the ability to sort out whether there's something that's truly enhancing or has inherent T1 signal. Um, so that basically covers our approach uh, to uh, the MRI of the lumbar spine. And um, let me go back here and we'll just do a quick recap. Um, so big picture, you want to get a sense of what's happening to the patient. You, you know, as usual, you would want to take a look at prior imaging and be correlating dynamically with that as well. Um, and then as we head into the study, it's go really good practice to make sure that you're not missing any sort of incidental pathology or even potentially explanatory pathology outside of the spinal anatomy itself. We're going to look at the T2 weighted images, um, for, or sorry, the STIR images for edema, for fluid signal. We're going to look at, we're going to rely on the T2s uh, and T1s to take a look at the spinal anatomy and look for alignment, for preservation of the vertebra, the, the, the vertebral bodies, the posterior elements, um, and uh, look at the discs, and then take a look at marrow signal, disc signal, uh, and then finally, and then taking a look at the resulting impact on the spinal canal, on the nerve foramina, on the descending, uh, on, on, on the catequina, on the visualized lower aspirate cord, on the nerve roots as they exit out into the nerve foramina, and then dynamically as we need throughout the course of study using the post-contrast images or else going through a full search pattern on the post-contrast images and being careful to check um, concordant signal abnormality of the axials and the sagittals when there is artifact. And then if needed, creating post, uh, post-process subtraction images to sort out true uh, abnormal enhancement.